Thank you, Warren. Wow, uh, this is the biggest crowd I ever talked to. <laughs> oh, you guys made me nervous. All right, okay, good. So today, I'm going, well, I, you, you see, I'm, I changed the title a little bit. My focus today will be electrons in solids. I'm going to tell you a few things that you may or may not know already about electrons. What we are going to expect to see and what's some interesting phenomena we can actually demonstrate together. Okay. And from that, we're going to come out a few concepts about electron and sol solids. I'm going to talk exactly what I'm talking about. And uh, we're going to look at one specific compound. This is called Samara Hexbori, or SMB6. That's showing on, well, the left figure there. You see that's a small, teeny, tiny crystal, kind of bluish. And it's sitting on piece of dime. And uh, what? That small crystal. And with what we do, with we figure out that once we have some strong magnetic field, I'm going to tell you exactly what the magnetic field is, but we have a super strong magnetic field, and we start to see that such sample start to wiggle and stronger fields. On the right panel there, you see that the term magnetization turns up, down, up, down, and it changes dramatically as we make fields up. It turns out from such wiggling we can figure out exactly what kind of electrons are inside and what kind of topology are inside. Okay. All right. Before I start, let me thank the funding agents for such research work. And uh, the, the funding comes from uh, Department, of, Department of Energy, our university MQ project, and the Natural Science Foundation. The data, particularly that right figure, was taken in that big M. That's the Magna Lab in Tallahassee, Florida. And this, this talk is a serious uh, outreach effort for ICAM and ICAM Square conference. OK, good. And uh, this is our team. We have wonderful sample providers from all over the world. Uh, we have samples from UC Irvine, USTC, that's in China, Maryland, and Johns Hopkins. And our team here, my group, then Jim Allen's group, Charlie Kodak's group and the Kaiser's group, and you see there on the right panel. And of course, the major players are postdocs and students here. The very first guy, Gang Li, led the whole work, did the wonderful research, and the, the, the rest are students from my group or Charlie Kodak's group. We even have visiting students from China and an undergraduate from our physics department who has been spending two years with us and published a paper together with us. Okay, and you can see that um, Ben Lawson is probably the most relaxed person, <laughs> right? Have a bow tie. All right, he actually is great. He's my first student, had papers really early on in his first term, and uh, he actually helped me a lot preparing this talk. Okay, good. All right, let me motivate you a little bit. Why we ever talk about electrons in solids, right? I assume you have turned off your cell phone. Well. If not, you can check. There must be CPUs inside. Yeah, the CPU, a computer chip, uses a charge property for, elec for electrons to do this fancy operation. Or I assume you have a Gmail or whatever email service that give you 20, 30 gigabyte storage. All this big storage comes from the fact that there's also spins of electrons. You are using the ordering of these spins to store information. I'm going to talk exactly about uh, what these terms are. But basically, that's the foundation of information storage we are having now. OK, so that's the past, or that's the current. About future, we argue that maybe we're going to have another kind of solids. This kind of solids, due to the special electrons inside, will become a bulk insulator, but a surface conductor. And if that's true, then we can try to make circuits as small as possible using only surface, right? And patch as many as possible transistor, whatever, in your small chip. That would be wonderful future electronics. So today, hopefully by the end of this talk, I'm going to convince you that this compound, Simera hexbore, the very first crystal I showed you on the first slides, can be one potential candidate for topological insulator. Okay, so that's our motivation. And uh, throughout our line, see, I list a lot of stuff there. I'm going to tell you exactly what are electrons, what we care about in solids. I'm going to talk 
talk about a few interesting phenomena coming out of electrons. Coming from magnetism, magnet, and from there, I'm going to explain this term, magnetization, a big M for that. I'm going to talk about superconductors. I'm going to explain what its resistance are using that demo. We are going to see how magnets and superconductors are interact with each other. It's going to give us something really interesting. As you can see, there's a big track there. I'm going to show you that superconductor can fly on top of a piece of magnet. OK. Further, I'm going to show you something, a demonstration that may or may not use superconductor to have it fly on a piece of magnet. Well, you will judge whether it's a room temperature superconductor or that's something special. But I want to say that from that, you will see that this term, Dirac electron, is important. It's something really unique about electrons in solids. And I'm going to come back, come to the similar hex borer and demonstrate how we are able to confirm there are Dirac electrons from on the surface of similar hex borer. OK, so that's a plane. And now let's look at electrons. Very first, what do we learn about electrons? Well, we learn there must be charge. How do we know that? Well, we have light bulbs here. Or here, we are passing some current through, where, through a piece of school. And I have a light bulb who is happily giving some light and walking there. Having a light bulb giving light, that's seeing some charge actually moving inside, or their electron motion inside, particularly in that piece of school. OK. Well, so we know there's charge. And the fact that any piece of metal, any piece of solids can hold the mo motion of charge and that ability to transfer electricity or electrical charge is resistivity. That's one term we're going to keep coming back. OK. All right, so that's one thing we learn about charge. The other thing, well, sorry, I put a few equations there. But basically, any electrons inside solids, you can think about it's like a classical object. It's a classical object having energy and momentum. And it's a classical object showing that energy goes as momentum squared. OK, this is something we always do from very starting points. But let me show you the classical example or classical flying object. And here in Michigan, we have a football. OK, my student Ben Lawson threw a football to me. All right, let me confess first, right? This is my first time ever catching a football. <laughs> OK? You see, a few things you may notice, right? This guy has a momentum in a sense. Oh, it hurts me really hard. OK, it has energy because I really have to do something to catch it. Let me show you two other things that you may find interesting. Let me do that again. All right, so first thing, you may notice that the ball is fl kind of flat. Well, OK, we did not intentionally deflate it. <laughs> Second, look at the football. It's spiraling. It's spinning. OK, such spinning turns out to be a very, well, you are all experts, right? Wonderful thing for football. You have to get a spin to go close to the same direction as the momentum, kind of lock in there. That's actually very important for electrons in solids. OK, anyway, so electrons have this, also this kind of spin. And uh, what do we actually see? Well, electron is not exactly a classical object. It shows a spin as a result, as physical observation. It works as if a compass like this, OK? So now I see the compass is kind of pointing to a random direction, but eventually, hopefully, that goes to north, uh, that goes to south, OK? So electrons having a spin, and that spin just behaves like this compass. As you can see on the right panel there, well, electrons tend to spin and giving you a small vector or small magnet like this guy. And that what happens for spin in electrons in solids, OK? All right, so that's electrons and spins. One, one more term I want to um, learn about that. I don't want to bore really about many details, but basically, there are so many electrons in solids. You have to patch it to add more and more inside. Eventually, you're going to fill up to some shell, and that shell we call the Fermi surface. 
It turns out that, that shell can be different shapes. For example, we can stretch it, make a sphere to be ellipsoid. We can even try to do something ugly, make a, something like duck, a dog's bone. OK, let me ask you, right? what's the key difference between this guy and then that guy? Of course, shape is different. But you may notice that there's a circle inside. There's a hole inside, right? From this and that, there's a hole happening. It turns out that's really about topology. So picture that you have a sphere, like our Earth. You can squeeze it and make a cube. OK. But picture you have a coffee mug, right? Coffee mug, you're going to have a hollow hole there, not full, but a really full hole there. So you can still squeeze that, and what do you observe? You can squeeze and make a donut. <laughs> but you cannot make a sphere or make a doll because exactly there's a hole inside. Okay. That's a key difference, as you can see, from this kind of farming surface and this kind of farming surface. Let me just tell, tell you, this is exactly what happens in a piece of copper. And that's exactly what happens on a piece of, well, you may hear about that, bismuth. OK. All right, good. Now, I, talk, I, I talked about a lot about electrons and solids. Well, we probably have experts here about high-energy electrons. It turns out once we accelerate electrons to really high speed, close to speed of light, C, then their energy is proportional to momentum rather than momentum squared. For typical electrons in solids, it's like a football. You go as P squared, whereas for 100 electrons, it goes just as P. This is a result coming from Einstein's special relativity, usually for very high energy electrons. And today, I'm going to show you that for some solids, they actually indeed have such kind of phenomena in solids, even though the electrons are not that, that fast. And I'm going to show you a few demos, particularly one that coming from this property, solids can fly on piece of magnet. All right. OK, that's about single electrons in solids. How many electrons do we know in each solid? There are plenty. There are plenty here. On the left panel, it's just one piece of samples I will study. I was studying this guy. I'm not going into detail about what that is. But the key point is that we can take a picture about where each atoms are. And this is so-called transition electron microscope. And you see that here in this bar, um, roughly have two nanometers. One nanometer is 10 to minus 9 meter. One meter is about a yard. OK, as you can see, in such a short distance, we're patching one, two, three, four, five, five atoms there. Uh, each atoms have probably 30 or 40, even, even 100 electrons there. So given this length scale, we are going to have many, many electrons in that solid. Order of 10 to 23. That's more than billion, trillion, whatever numbers are there. And what's the result? To understand electrons in solids, are we going to look at each electron and try to count all these guys together and see what's going on? Or we try to look for some pattern. Well, I would think that just like looking at birds, right? If there are many, many, many electrons, would that mean that all of them are going to fly random directions and give us a chaos? Or, well, here in Michigan, we know spring, winter, or well, early fall, we're going to see this pattern of migration. They have nice V shape come out of birds, or even W shape, or whatever shapes we have in there. So my point coming from birds, going from this way to that way, so many, many, many stuff, or many electrons, they may be able to do something collectively to give you some new phase, new state, new physical phenomena. And that's a point that made very clear by my former mentor, Philip W. Anderson. And his point is for you. There are many body effects of electrons, and the more is different. More is different in the sense they're going to create a new symmetry, new topology, new geometry, whatever, and give you a few new physical states. OK, now let's see what kind of thing we can see during daily life. Very no, very first one, magnet. What is a magnet? Here's a magnet. As you can see, 
Well, compass is probably the best example going to, right, going to a line to north or south, right? I have a bigger magnet here. I'm going to approach to the compass, as you can see, now they are turning. Okay? This is nothing special, just like magnets on, your, on the wall of your refrigerators. Okay. Now, what's auto magnets? Let's act, now let's look at this. Let's look at picture. Oops, this is this guy. All right, so here on the left and the right screen, you see a bar, right? And I'm telling you it's a magnet. As you can see, I'm putting a compass there to just going around. And you may see that the north needle keeps pointing to some direction, now turns to south and all the random directions, right? Okay? So that tells us we have a north pole and south pole out of this magnet. Okay, now let's try to see what can be out of this magnet. Here I'm going to have some sands. I'm going to pull around that. Okay, I'm going to tap it. Okay, what do you see? Sands gets some lines, right? Needles. Yeah, they're needles, of course. <laughs> yeah. So these needles point to a certain direction. I follow kind of nice pattern out, right? Going from one end and move around to the other end. And that's a picture. And here is the other one we took before. So there are lines coming out of magnets, going from North Pole to South Pole. Okay, what are these lines? Well, we have a term, we physicists call it a uh, magnetic field, or oh, we're gonna use B to stand for that. It's how the magnet is doing any force or anything else. It's sending out these lines. In this particular demonstration on the left and right there, it's aligning these small needles or this kind of sets with iron inside, try to align them, right? And these are field lines. It turns out that's the primary tool we are going to use. We are going to generate different strands of magnetic field, different strands of B fields, and use that to study physical property. Okay. So that's the first concept. Then one thing, as you can see, I had this small compass going around this guy underneath all these magnet lines, right? What did I observe or you observe? They're turning around. Okay, so we're putting a compass underneath of these this, uh, field lines and they're gonna rotate exactly how they are rotating tell us about magnetization. And the magnetization describes how a B field, a magnetic field, turns the spins in solids. That's in another important concept I'm going to talk about. And by the way, I'm going to use M a lot of times to stand for magnetization. And that's the basic quantity we're going to measure. Okay, the fact that these solids are going to rotate, the compass is going to rotate on the magnetic field lines that due to the fact that there's a torque. It's like your wheel, right? Your wheel, your turn, because you put a torque there. Magnetic field B put a torque on the M. Okay, good, all right. So here are a few points, and we have seen one state, that's magnet. Now let's move on to look at the superconductor. Okay, that's an, a different state. And let's try to understand what's going on with the superconductor. Before that, let's see this piece of aluminum. Okay, this is a piece of aluminum, and it's a good conductor. Good conductor in a sense, you can pass a current through that. And I'm showing on this left panel, it's a, well, it's a sketch. Of course, there are, a, there are many electrons inside. Okay, we can try to pass some electrical current through that. And that's showing on the upper right panel. You would have an electrical current and electrical voltage. Eventually, the ratio is resistance. Okay, I know it's hard to follow. Analogy would be water in a pipe. Well, to push water into a pipe, right, you have to put some pressure or put some force. That force is like the voltage. That's on the very up there, V. Water flows, it has a speed. So it has a current, right? 
Now you know that you're going to have some force to push water through the pipe. That, that means for water, there's a resistance. Pr force over the current would be the resistance. In this case, it's a vo electrical voltage over electrical current. That's the resistance. The fact that we need to get some voltage to push electrons through this piece of aluminum, that says we're going to have a finite resistance for a piece of conductor or a piece of metal. OK. That's happening in daily life. See? Room temperature, right? If we are going to very low temperature, very, very low temperature, what's going to happen? These electrons in this piece of aluminum are going to start to pair. And such a pair would bring the resistance to zero. As, a, as observation, then you can see that in the upper right panel, you can still get a lot of electrons there, but you do not need any voltage drop. You can pass something, pass the electrical energy through the sample without energy loss. That's a superconductor. That's something really unique happening at very low temperature. And a few examples of superconductor, as you can see, I'm listing there. Um, it says YBACU, or that's YBCO. And there are some other compounds that recently discovered superconductors. One starts from SM or CMRM, one ends with boron. Well, I made that highlight there for these elements because later you're going to see that these elements now make a superconductor. In our current research, we can put them together to make a good topological insulator. That's a topic we'll actually talk about today. All right, good. OK, so next step, superconductor magnets, what happens when they are put together? Well, now, Matt is going to come here to help us for this demonstration. So we're having a track of many, many magnets on that. A piece of superconductor right now has been cooled down. Well, this is, this is a room temperature one. OK, I'm going to just put it here. As you can see, kind of a black stuff, right? A ceramic. On this track, well, it does not fly. But it's, it's, an, well, it's a really nice large piece. I, I wish I had one piece like that. OK. All right, OK. So that piece does not fly. What Matt did 10 minutes ago, he poured liquid and nitrogen to a boat filled with this, the similar piece there. Now, as you see, this boat is flying. And how do we know it's exactly flying? Well, let me see if that works. Let me stop it here. You see, I got a piece of paper down, right? Well, I mean, I'm not really playing magic. It's physics. <laughs> OK? All right. The reason why this, this ball likes, likes to fly on a piece of magnet, that's exactly due to the fact that superconductor has this special property. I'm listing them on, the, on my center slides there. It shows the term. Diamagnetism there. What is diamagnetism? Well, magnetism tells you how stuff gets magnetized. By dia there, it says it's going to push against. right? As I show you in the panel there, it somehow generates a magnetization of M. And such a thing, for superconductor, they like to bring it in a different direction as my magnetic fields. It tends to repel. It tends to get rid of field lines away from the superconductor. Such a term is a diamagnetism. As a consequence, you see that this piece of bolt, this piece of superconductor, is flying on top of the magnet. Or it's levitated by the magnet, right? It's a, it's a typical magnetic levitation demonstration for superconductors. OK, so we have a superconductor going there. By the way, that's the same track. OK, now, many of you probably have seen this kind of demonstration before. There are many YouTube videos about Magnetic levitation, right? One thing, people always think that the diamagnetism just tells us superconductor hits magnet. Is that true? Well, it's not exactly right. Now let's do the following. Matt is going to turn the whole thing upside down. OK. 
Okay, keep going. Keep going. Let's let's turn upside down. Yeah. All right. You see that now it's kind of locked there, right? It's still moving. Now let's go all the way 180 degree. All right. It's still flying. It's levitation, but not just pushing away. Rather, it's really holding there. As you can see, you may see the face of or my hands there, right? It's really upside down. Now let's have a few turns. It's really flying. Actually, would you like to now come back? All right. You may also notice there are some white stuff coming out of that boat, right? That's exactly liquid nitrogen. It's a liquid nitrogen in the sense we are keeping the whole thing cold there. And uh, because we got it upside down, there are a lot of stuff coming out. But still, in this angle, it's still flying. Okay, if you know something about pendulum, it's just like a land, lousy pendulum. Um, really lousy pendulum. All right, okay. So what I'm hoping to see that eventually, oh, there's just too much liquid nitrogen there. Okay, um, well, when I tried to practice this at some point, but the whole thing dropped down, and which made me mad and weren't really a heart attack. Yeah, because because this is a larger piece and they do not want to break it. Anyway, now it, they want to stay. Okay, the fact that at some point they drop, that's exactly because it's a superconductor having only a low temperature, right? Then once the liquid nitrogen got out of the boat, right? Then it's warm and it's no longer a superconductor. They cannot be hold, uh, hold well by the magnets. All right. So what we are seeing here, superconductor does not really or oh, simply hate magnets. Rather, they work together. They work to, together so that magnets can hold superconductors. Or oh, the technical term actually here, it says a field lines. I think, okay, it's hot. All right. So now it's getting warmer. So no longer, they can no longer feel pin magnetic field lines inside. It's no longer a good superconductor. Okay. As, as a result, let's see, drops. Okay. Good. So this actually shows the magnetic field pinning for superconductors for superconductor or magnets. But anyway, I think this is a really wonderful way to demonstrate both magnet and superconductors for electrons in solids. They're just two important collective phenomena for electrons, for many, many electrons in solids. All right, good. I showed you something happening cold. Now I'm going to show you something happening at room temperature. Another magnetic levitation. I'm going to let you judge whether this is a room temperature superconductor or not. Okay, so what's shown here, I have no, another piece of magnet. All right, on the left and right figure, you can see this magnet. And let me see if I have enough vision to show. Well, unfortunately, I do not, but basically, I have a compass nearby, the needle is still turning. But key points, I have a magnet there, as you can see, I'm getting turning a little bit. I have a yellow stuff flying on that track made out of magnets. All right, so you see it's actually kind of wiggling, flying, and gets levitated there. All right, what is this? Is this a room temperature superconductor? Well, it's like a mystery. I know as a physicist, there's no room temperature superconductor. But why we're able to let something fly with a magnet? Just like superconductor. Okay, I would like a few volunteers coming here. Let come here, try to help us. Come, come, come. Let's try to uh, try to help us figure out what this is. All right, so now you see this guy is flying, right? Okay, I'm going to get this piece out. Um, get this piece out. Okay. Yeah, what's your name again? Daniel. Daniel, what's your name? Samuel. Samuel, and you're Patrick, right? Okay, yeah, okay. Daniel, would you like to scratch the whole thing on this piece of paper and tell me what happens? Just write. What do you see? It makes marks. It makes marks. Why does that make marks? Because it's 
Is there something on the end? Yeah, something on that. That's wonderful. Now, okay, I have this pencil. So you have Sam, right? Yep. Yeah, okay, Sam. Would you like to write something on that? Whatever you want to write. I mean, okay, tell me what that is out of that pencil. Lead. Yes, pencil lead. Wonderful. All right, so now, um, Patrick, I'm not sure if you're good with this pencil. Can you get this lead out? Out of this pencil? I know kids know how to do that. Okay, that's good enough. Super. Okay, but okay. Patrick, let, let's put that on. So this is a piece of la this is a piece of pencil lead. Patrick is going to put on his track. And uh, it is flying. Daniel and Sam, can you can you check? It's moving. It's moving. Okay, Sam, would you like to try that? So did that get levitated? Mm -hmm. oh. uh, yeah, yeah. It looks like it. Looks like it's flying, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's just like, let's bring that piece back. It's actually doing the same thing. All right, okay. So effectively, we're having the same, same thing there. It's a pencil lead. I'm having pencil lead there and it gets levitated by this track. All right. Um, thank you, guys. Before you go, yeah. I have a, yeah. I have a one more question. What's inside the pencil lead? Graphite. What's inside pencil lead? I don't even know what's inside. It's graphite. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But but one thing that you may know, graphite is carbon. Oh. Yeah. Carbon or graphite. Yeah. Yes. Great. Thank you very much. All right, great, thank you. Yeah. All right, so what exactly what we did, yeah. Um, we have the pencil lead here, and the water actually paint a little bit, some yellow stuff there, just for you to see what happens with that pencil lead. All right, but effectively, anything coming out of this pencil can get levitated here. Okay, all right, so. Well, I do not have, have a room temperature superconductor. It's a piece of graphite. Okay, in case you may not have a clear vision through this guy, we actually took a video. And you see that that yellow stuff or that graphite gets levitated there and kind of wiggling, flying, levitating uh, throughout the whole track. Okay, I have something levitated at room temperature, just like superconductor and low temperature. And the reason why we had levitation at room temperature, sorry, at the low temperature of superconductor, we know it's a strong dial mechanism there. Here, we have a piece of pencil lead. As a manual, you point out, it's graphite. Graphite can do the same thing. Graphite or something coming out of carbon, right, can do the same thing, make a strong dial magnetic contribution there to get itself lifted. Okay. The exact reason why graphite gets levitated, it turns out, it comes from the fact, same fact that there are direct electrons in graphite. There are direct electrons where energy goes linear with momentum, E goes linear with P. You see a straight line there, right? And I emphasized before, usually direct electrons happen only for high energy electrons in accelerator. You may heard about LHC, and this is actually a picture of slack. But anyway, once electron gets rid of high speed, you have this linear relationship. It turns out for graphite, for some reason, it can still do the same thing. Kind of some magic there, but such existence of direct electrons are really able to lift a whole thing up, give out strong dimensionism, and showing this um, levitation. OK, good. All right, so there are many, solid, many other solids showing direct electrons. Just showed you the graphite, or that's a picture. Oh, that's this picture of graphite where black stuff is really carbon. Okay, and we also have bismuth showing a lot of direct electrons. There's such a thing, topological insulator, where I started to motivate you, right? Turns out on surface there are also direct electrons 
for this commands. All right. Now let's come back to graphite. Again, this is a demo for graphite. Now if we're able to just cut and chop, get only one atomic layer out of that, well, people made a term for that called graphene. But anyway, graphene turns out they are able to have this nice honeycomb lattice as shown for this demo or this figure on top. It's honeycomb lattice and each circle there, each, each, each story there is a copper atom. Okay, and we know that in graphite in direct electrons, to demonstrate there are direct electrons in graphene, there are actually a lot of wonderful works which also got them Nobel Prize. And here, what did they demonstrate? They demonstrated the following. They tried to put some magnetic field, as you can see, I'm going to use, use a mouse, right? They're gonna put some strong magnetic field, B there, going strong, and the third resistance here, start to show some wiggles. The other black curve there, it's also resistant, but measuring different com configuration. What well, we feel is called the Hall effect, but anyway, it's resistance. And you see that they show this nice pattern or even flat parts. So they are able to track where the peak or dips are, giving numbers or sequences for this using the fact they have some flat parts and get something, get normalized. And they have location in terms of magnetic field B, this numbers associated with that, and then putting that together, they were able to contrast something. But before we do that, let me try to explain why resistance tends to make all these wiggles. Well, what happens for electrons with magnet? It turns out if you just have a poor electrons, you put some magnetic fields there, a line there, they're going to get into some quantized orbitals. They're going to move circularly and go into, into different orbitals. And such a thing we actually call the London levels, but anyway. Such quantized orbitals, because they are quantized, they are able to change the physical properties to make a nice oscillation pattern, and we call it quantum oscillation. An example we are showing here is coming from my group. It's actually my, my first paper uh, uh, by Ben Laws and myself, published here in Michigan. Here, the magnetic torque or magnetization, you see this shows really nice periodical pattern going from high fields to low fields. Okay. And it turns out oscillation frequency tells us about the shape of so-called firm surface that we introduced in very early, very early studies. And uh, we call this ellipsoid, right? How did we know it's ellipsoid? It turns out exactly we are going to use the fact there's oscillation pattern, and we are going to just use the fact oscillation pattern measures the frequency that's proportional to the cross-section of these pockets. And from this, we are able to track it's an ellipsoid. Just like we are looking at a watermelon, how do we know it's ellipsoid? We get a big knife to slide it. We get a big knife to cut it. One way, we see a circle. And then that's cutting this way, right? Or oh, we're not starting to cut it that way, we're going to see ellipse. So basically, magnetic field is like a big knife. You're going to turn the directional B field. It's like you, you start to cut your watermelon in different direction. And basically, you can try going from a circle like this, and then turn different angle, gets elongated, stretch, 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 if that eventually gets really long ellipsoid, ellipse, and turn that pattern, give us an ellipsoid. Okay, so that's a really powerful tool. That tells us about geometry or even topology for electrons in solids. Okay, now back to the slides for graphene, or single layer graphite. Such a property gave this nice oscillation pattern for resistance. And this resistance pattern, again, shows the peaks and dips. And shows the peaks and dips associated with some integers, which is actually inferred by the value of the, uh, this black curve there. And from that, they're able to track exactly coming from, see, from one curve. One curve here. They are going to report what the field of value is. Actually, here, it's, it's one, one over B, one over B, so inverse of that field value. And then plot against the integer they're having there. So they have this nice straight line showing that it's periodic. But key points, they have all these nice lines getting all these different, different conditions. They can extract whatever happens near the origin. Goes close to origin or goes where the one over B goes to zero. 
inverse of B goes to zero, that means the magnetic field gets to infinite. Magnetic field gets to infinite. Well, as you can see, we're going to have some intercept here, this value or that value. So they are reporting the absolute value of that intercept here in this corner. They observe one half there. Okay. It turns out such one half is the exact consequence of Dirac electrons. Well, I sh we showed this pattern before, where energy goes linear with momentum. It turns out the fact that there's one half simply comes from the fact that there are always electrons that like to sit exactly in the corner. Right in that that crossing points, there will be electrons kind of split in half, one going up, one going down. That's a fact. That's the exact reason why they say one half. And that's a demonstration or a proof of Dirac electrons in graphene. Okay. I know this is part of quite technical. I just want to cover that. And turns out we're going to compare with the study on graphene to show that Simera hexborer actually does similar thing. All right. Good. That's graphene. We demonstrate the Dirac electrons there. What is Simera hexborer? It sounds something really weird. There are different atoms. Um, here, I have a um, table of the elements. Samarum is something really heavy. It goes to a corner of the lattice. So imagine you just have a number of elements uh, packed together. One unit is whatever packed in that upper side, um, upper side cubic there. So one side is samarum. Boron is something really light. They put six boron together and pack into the corner. Okay, so that's what happens for Samara hexboron in one unit. Then you picture that you move this as one unit and keep adding, add, add, and eventually you get this crystal. That blue crystal on the um, left panel is a Samara hexboron with nice shining surface there. What's mystery for Samara hexboro? SMB6, I'm, I'm going to see that. This is its resistance, okay? On the right panel, I'm plotting the resistance against temperature. This is a curve taken by my colleague, Charlie Kodak, and his students a few years ago. And they were able to see two interesting phenomena. One is, as you see, we cool down this, going to low temperature. By the way, I'm going to explain what K is, it's a Kelvin. I'm going to explain what does that mean corresponding what we know about temperature. But basically, as we, as we cool down, the curve tends to go up, up, up. That's really a behavioral insulator. Because if you follow this, this red line, you would believe that going really to low, lower temperature, the whole thing going not carry any electrical current at all. Because resistance going into infinite, you're going to need huge voltage to pass any current through. Well, that's an insulator. But as you see, cool down below 3, 3 Kelvin there, the whole thing turns, turns it down. It tends to saturate. It changes from an insulator to a conductor or piece of metal. Now, this is a dilemma. We have a compound, Samara hexborate. For some property, it's like an insulator. But for some other property, it's like a conductor. What's really behind that? Well, there's always debates, but my colleague uh, Kai Song and his collaborators was able to demonstrate or, or predict that maybe such a thing, a so-called topological insulator, in a, in a sense, they got some really well-protected surface, even though the bulk is an insulator. Okay, there are some nice predictions coming out of that. I'm not going through that, but the key points, they're going to see that at low temperature, the whole thing is, turns into an insulator inside itself. But on the surface, it's a good surface conductor. And the fact that they have good surface conductor is exactly comes from the fact that there are Dirac electrons on the surface, just like graphene. OK. All right. And uh, of course, that's theory, right? How do we know it's really true? Well, there are, later, there are demonstrations of surface conductance. Let me just quickly go through this. They're coming from, this is Charlie and Kodak, my colleague's work, where they were able to demonstrate a different way of measuring resistance and showing it's a kind of non-local conductor. It's really happening on the surface. There are other two groups, one from UC Irvine, one from, um, one from Maryland. They were able to show similar behavior. Okay, 
But key points, now we are going to have, we're going to test whether this guy, Samuel Hexbury, is a topological insulator. The message there, if it's true, we are going to compare the surface of Samuel Hexbury with the graphene. If the theory holds, then we're going to see similar behavior as graphene for Samuel Hexbury, or the surface of Samuel Hexbury. So that's the goal. Well, that's really a challenging goal. For graphene, we know we start by measuring resistance in strong magnetic fields and seeing all these wiggles, right? Key point is the wiggles. Looking at all these wiggles, you are going to see some behavior, and you're able to align them and trying to find one particular integer and intercept. And that's how they demonstrate its Dirac system. It's a Dirac electron there. Okay. Well, for us, maybe natural thing is try to see if we are going to see these nice wiggles in resistance. Well, let me confess again, we did not. Life really sucks. <laughs> All right, as a young physicist struggling for tenure, we are just trying to learn about this, get some funding, get a piece of sample, going to Florida, Tallahassee, Florida, to get to 45 Tesla magnets. And we have strong field, even stronger than graphene, the study for graphene, and then we measure resistance up to 45 Tesla. We saw something, of course, there are nice curves, but we did not observe nice wiggles, like what happens in graphene. OK, well, you see that um, for physicists, right? The common feeling is frustration. <laughs> it's sense of failure. It's struggling. So it's such a way that, um, see my students, Ben Lawson, he joined me. Three years ago, we went to Los Alamos, we went to Tallahassee. One thing he kept telling me that at some point, we should buy a, either a sandbox or sandbag or a door in a lab. Well, we have frustration. We have some way to release. Well, OK. But after that, we still need to figure out a solution. Right? Our solution turns out, in static resistance, we are going to look at the magnetization. We are going to look at how, just like spin or this compass on the surface of Samira Hexbore, and get turned by magnetic fields. Because from history, we learned that this is probably the most reliable way to determine quantum oscillation. At least the history shows that the very first demonstration of Fermi surface or quantum oscillation was coming out of magnetization measurements for single crystal business. OK. Well, of course, this, there's a lot of technical challenge in the sense we have a surface. And how do we measure a single atomic layer and determine its magnetization? It's teeny tiny really teeny and tiny force. But how do we do? Well, we're just like working with the compass. Imagine now on the bottom panel, we have some spin associated with each surface. Then we apply a magnetic field. What will happen? Well, just like we bring a magnetic compass near a magnet, the compass is going to turn, or such a torque is going to turn these this spins or sample on that. We're going to measure this torque by having this piece of sample sitting on a floppy kind of lever. And then we apply some fields, the kind of lever going to turn. From the deflection of the kind of lever, we know the torque, and we know the magnetization. It's a very simple, straightforward idea, just coming from what we learned in the classical mechanics or classic electromagnetism. OK. Now, that's the simple idea how we, how we made it true. Well, this is, again, very early picture. I took my I was still student in grad school. We had a floppy kind of lever. Let me, let me actually work with this. OK, I have a floppy kind of lever sitting here. It's actually there's a sapphire there to holding the whole thing. OK, there's a piece of sample. This is not similar hex bar. Rather, in that case, it's a large bismuth, single crystal bismuth. But we have this pad, we have this kind of lever. And here, this shining surface is a gold film. Between that gold film and a, and a kind of lever on top, we are making a small gap. We are making a gap like 0.1, 0.2 millimeter. So now, if you have a few, some knowledge about circuits, right? We have a conductive cantilever. We have another film. What makes in between? Well, it's a capacitor. We can measure the value of this capacitor to determine the deflection of the cantilever. And from that, we learn about the torque, and we learn about the magnetization. OK, that's a simple idea of how we actually did the measurements. Well, I showed you the whole setup on a piece of penny. 
this guy. This, um, this, uh, this golden piece is a penny. Okay, I showed you a piece of penny to show you the size of setup, right? I also showed you a piece of penny to show, show you how, how, we physics, how cheap we physicists are. <laughs> we just make tons of these guys and try to tailor that for our own research. Whenever our collaborators send us our sample, we're going to make one to fit for them. Okay, good. So that's our small setup, but we need big instruments to get to this high field and low temperature. All right. On the left panel, it's, some, it's something here in the basement of Randall. It's in my lab. It's a fridge that goes to eight tesla magnetic fields. And what is eight tesla magnetic fields? You have, see, you have a magnet on your refrigerator, right? And eight tesla is more than 1,000 times stronger than the field on, rare earth, on the refrigerator magnets. And temperature goes down to 0.02 Kelvin. Very low temperature. How, do we, how low is that? Is? Well, let's feel what Kelvin is. Last winter, it was brutal. <laughs> OK? So in that room, in that room, 9 o'clock, I had a class. It's 8 o'clock, I had a message from a student copying the page from web.com, weather.com. It shows temperature 26 below Fahrenheit without wind chill. With the wind chill, it's close to 40. OK. Well, you see, I'm from China, right? I came with no idea what Fahrenheit is. Now I get to learn. OK. It turns out from this painful winter, we learned that 40 below Fahrenheit is 40 below Celsius. Doesn't matter. <laughs> well, OK. But basically, this cold temperature is still more than 200 Kelvin. OK? Matt just did this wonderful demonstration for superconductor. There we cool down stuff with liquid nitrogen. And what temperature that is? 77 Kelvin. OK, what do we see here? Below 1 Kelvin, 0 0.01, 0 0.02 Kelvin. So that's the condition we started our research. We got all this interesting phenomena. And of course, we went to Tallahassee, Florida. Right panel there is in the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory. There we have 45 Tesla, which is more than 9,000 times stronger than the refrigerator magnet, or more than a million times stronger than the Earth's magnetic fields. That's strongest DC magnetic fields we can ever get on Earth. OK, well, of course, it's on Earth, right? Imagine that you can visit a neutron star. You'll get huge magnetic fields out of that. Well, this is on Earth. OK, good. So I showed you the setup. I showed you our, our uh, equipment. Let's look at one or two plots. OK, so here we look at the, the wiggle or magnetic torque against magnetic fields. You see, again, in the center plot there, I'm having a flop. We, we are having a cantilever there and a piece of sample attached on that cantilever. We apply magnetic fields and start to track how the whole thing gets wiggling by measuring the, uh, by measuring the deflection of the cantilever. You see that? Starting around 5 or 10 Tesla, we are seeing these wiggles, slow wiggles, or even some fast wiggles. Just like what we saw graphing, right? We start to observe oscillation. We say it's a quantum oscillation, and then this is a fact that is coming from surface or firm surfaces on surface states. OK, we see these wiggles, and we start to learn something about the surface. And further, from that talk data, we're able to determine what magnetization is from this piece of single crystal, similar hex bar, and we, we measure magnetization against magnetic fields, in this case, up to 45 Tesla. So that's actually the magnet we're talking about. We went from 0 to 45. Again, see this slow wiggles and fast wiggles, or even some beating pattern for that wiggles. It turns out that the electronic states for the surface of similar hex bar is very interesting, quite complicated. There are three different pockets, three different sizes. Very interesting topology and geometry happening there. OK, that's actually going to be another talk to talk about different shape or different geometry there, just for that service. But the point I want to make is the following. So now, as you can see, I have all these wiggles going up, down, up, down, right? I can track exactly where this guy turned down or turned up, and then associate that with certain integers, just like what happens in graphing. 
In this case, we are able to identify where magnetic field happens for each turn or plot that as 1 over b against certain integers. <coughs> now, you see that they are in a straight line. You see I'm, we are able to push all the way to lowest lunar level here. Well, we see they really go into last quantum orbits. And then what do we see for integer? Uh, what do we see for interceptor there? Minus one half. Recall for graphene, that's the evidence showing there's direct electrons for surfaces, for graphene. And in this case, that one half really shows the surface of Samara Hexbora is just like graphene. We're having nice direct electrons happening there. Okay, let me summarize my talk. Um, we, we have this Many, many electrons in solids, they're giving us wonderful phenomena. They can turn us into a magnet, or they give us magnet or a superconductor. As you can see, put together, they either lock each other or they are levitating, right? And I showed you unique direct electrons. It happens at room temperature levitation. And you guys came here to help me figure out exactly that's graphite. It's not a room temperature superconductor. We try to show that that Dirac electrons happening in single atomic layer graphene or, or this compound, Samara hexbore. That's blue compound there. And by tracking how the sample wiggles in strong fields, we're able to learn indeed that there are Dirac electrons on the surface of this compound. Or the whole thing inside the bulk is a conductor, is a insulator, I'm sorry. But surface is a good conductor, good conductor with this nice Dirac electrons. All right, let me just wake last plot. Again, let me come back to this. You see that we have spin for, for, uh, for, the, for the electrons, right? It turns out the locking between spin and momentum is very important to get direct electrons. Similar thing happening for, for, for football, where you see the directional momentum is the direction of the spin. They are locked for football. I actually have another figure where there is a professional thorn. You see how they are locked together and make your touchdown. All right, good. All right, thank you for your attention.